Those. Dan, I'm going to borrow this chair. I know it kind of messes you up with your design, but uh, we're going to get to this chair in just a second. It's reserved for a special person. Um, we're glad y'all are here. If you're happy to be here, say amen. 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 Uh, going to take a little audience uh, survey real quick. I want you to think about the, uh, uh, the kind of room that you sleep in. What is the, uh, what is the typical room that you like to sleep in, the, the, the sleeping arrangements that you must have? Um, here are some questions for you. Just uh, need you to raise your hand to help me out with this. If you're the type of person that needs to sleep with a little noise on oh, maybe a TV or a radio or one of those nature scene places, please raise your hand. If you're one of those type of people, you just got to have a little noise. All right. And I know some of you women are saying, I've got natural noise. It's my husband. You know, he's just, you know, you know snoring and spitting and all that stuff. Uh, all right. Um, how many of you type of person that you have to have a light on? Maybe a light in the hallway or in the bathroom or a night light. A lot, a lot of times kids are like that. I know my boys, we have to turn on the, the bathroom light so they can see. How many of you need a light? A little light. All right. Y'all are the weirdest people in this room. I'll just tell you that right now. I just don't understand that. Uh, how many of you have to have a fan? A fan. All right. Uh, last question. How many of you have to have a, uh, a dark and cold room? A dark and cold room. Okay. Uh, and this is all going to make sense in just a little bit. We all sleep a little differently. We all have our things that we've got to have. For me personally, my room has to be dark, has to be cold, and there has to be no noise. I'm just, that's just the way, the way I'm built. That's the way God made me. And uh, if there's any light in the room, I have to cover it up. Uh, Susie has an alarm clock that sits by our bed, and we actually have a towel that we put over the light just because I just, I mean, I just can't stand it. I just, it's just too bright. Um, what, a long time ago, back in, uh, back in the, the, the day, there was these things called VCRs, and uh, we used to have to cover up our VCRs so there wouldn't be any light in the room. I'm just that type of person. I like it dark, cold. No noise. I'd probably sleep very, very well in the cave. Um, but you know what's interesting? It's when you have a dark room, a little light is awfully bright. You ever notice that? I mean, you can have a completely dark room, but if there's just that, that one glimmer of light, it, it lights up the entire room. It, it, it shines bright. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about a, about a lady who was in a dark room extremely dark, pitch black. And all she was wanting was a little bit of light. Uh, in your Bibles, it's Mark chapter 5. It's a, it's a story uh, about a lady who was uh, just suffering uh, from a terrible condition for 12 years. Mark chapter 5, we will begin in verse 21. Here's what the Bible says. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. So Jesus encounters this man uh, who said that, that, uh, that he's got a little problem with his little girl. His little girl is dying and said, Please, Jesus, if you could come and help us out, I know that you can make her better. I know that you can do something. So Jesus gets up and he begins to travel to this place. And then... Verse 24, it says, A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. I mean, I was sick last night for about six hours, and I thought it was just horrendous. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but, but there's been all kinds of, of, of problems that I've had. My, probably the worst thing that ever happened to me was when I had chicken pox uh, when I was age 21. I actually, uh, we were actually playing in a volleyball league over at the Gibson Gym, and I, we were on the West Nashville Heights team at that time, playing against Western Hills. And I'll never forget, that night while I was playing volleyball, I was just burning up just, just with this enormous fever, sweating, just, just, I was just dying. I went over to Susie. I said, Susie, I just feel terrible. 
And uh, she said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. I just feel awful. So after, after West Asheville Heights beat y'all, just, you know, I just wanted to say that. But, uh, hey, we killed you. We killed you. That was when uh, Scotty Harris was here. So we used to love spiking on Scotty. Uh, but uh, went home that night. I took off my shirt, and there they were. Just hundreds of all these bumps, these chicken pox. I was sick for two weeks. I was 21 years old with chicken pox. Don't know if you could imagine what that pain was like. It was just awful. It was terrible. I, just, I, had, I had chicken pox on my feet, on my eyelids. I mean, it was everywhere. And I thought that was awful. For two weeks I had that. This woman, this woman has been sick for 12 years. Twelve long years. Not twelve weeks, not twelve months, but twelve years. Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Evidently, she had, uh, she had tried a lot of different things uh, to cure her. Um, she went to a lot of doctors. She spent all the money that she had. Uh, there were a lot of different home remedies that she could have went through. There's this book called the Talmud, which is uh, writings of, of, of Jewish rabbis. And there are different cures that she could have done. And, and some of those cures are kind of weird. They, for one thing, in the, in the Talmud, in this Jewish, uh, this Jewish law, she could have ate grasshopper eggs. Has anybody ever uh, eaten any grasshopper eggs? I didn't think so. She, so she could have had that. It also said she could carry around the tooth of a fox. Uh, another uh, law said that she could also carry around the ashes of an ostrich egg. So maybe she had done all that. We don't know, but it did say in the Bible that she'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is the woman that's in the dark room. We don't know her name. She's never mentioned anywhere else. She appears on the scene pushes through a crowd and touches the hem of his garment and then just disappears off the pages of the Bible. We don't know her name, but we know her situation. We know that she was in darkness and all she was looking for was just a little light. We know that for 12 years she was suffering and it said that she grew worse, that she had tried everything. She spent all of her money. She went to the doctor. She tried all these cures and nothing, not one thing could stop her bleeding. Not one thing could cure her. And all she wanted to do was to get rid of this sickness that she had had for 12 years. Relationally, she could not be with her husband. Maternally, she couldn't bear children. Domestically, her touch was unclean. Spiritually, she couldn't even be in the temple. I mean, this woman was ashamed, embarrassed, ostracized, alone. She was by herself. I mean, there was no one that wanted to be around this unclean woman for 12 long years. This woman suffered. Just think about that. But she knew that there was a man named Jesus. And she was going to do everything that she could to get to him, even if she was going to risk the fact that somebody in the crowd might have seen her. I mean, can you imagine? She's in this crowd, and I'm sure that people knew who she was. I'm sure that people talked. I mean, just like people talk and talk in our churches or in our jobs or our schools, you know, people can talk and they gossip and rumors. 
I know the people in the town knew about this woman. They said, oh, yes, there's a woman. She's been, she's been hurting for 12 years. She's nasty. She's unclean. She can't even go into the temple. And she was willing to risk being ashamed and embarrassed. She went through this crowd. And she pushed her way through. And she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. I mean, she didn't even need to say anything to him. She wasn't going to fall to his feet and beg and say, Jesus, please, please help me. God, please help me. Heal me. Do something. All she wanted to do was just reach out with her fingertips of faith and just touch the hem of his garment. And she knew, for some reason, she knew that it would be over. She knew that she'd be healed. She was down to her last shot, her last hope, her last prayer. It's kind of like the bottom of the ninth. It's like the, the end of the fourth quarter. That's what this woman had. She had a need, and she was very simply going to have it met. She had to see Jesus. You could say that she took a leap of faith. A lot of times we say a leap of faith, and we just kind of throw it out just very haphazardly. What is a leap of faith? A leap of faith is a conviction that God can and a hope that God will. And that's what this woman had. She knew in, in deep down inside of herself that if I could just get to Jesus and if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. That's all that she wanted. That's all that she was looking for. Now, here are some interesting lessons from this. I think that God's economy is upside down. I think the greater your cares, the greater your prayers. I don't think God looks down and sees us and, and is waiting for us to get our lives back together. In fact, I think God wants to come to us in our humble, uh, desperate state of lives. I think he wants to come down when we're at the very bottom of our barrel, when we're at the end of the rope. That's when God wants to intervene in our lives. It doesn't matter if you have it together. It doesn't matter if you're an elder or a preacher or a deacon or some staff member that gets paid. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church for one month or if you've been in church for 50 years. God's economy is upside down. It doesn't matter your prestige or your possessions or, or, or how successful you are or what kind of position you hold. God very simply says, I'll love you right where you're at. In fact, the more hopeless you are, the more likely you are for salvation. The darker your room, the greater need for light. God's economy is upside down. He loves everyone. I also find that God always responds to faith. This woman reached out to touch the hem of his garment, and Jesus responded by healing her. And we can look all through this book, and we can find... Many moments where God has responded to faith. An ark is built and eight people are saved. Staves are raised and seas are parted. A little boy brings lunch and 5,000 people get fed. God always responds to faith. And then finally, God always does business with the individual. The woman at the well. The woman caught in adultery. The tax collector. Uh, the story of the prodigal son. The lost sheep. The one Lost sheep, even though 99 were found, there was one sheep that was lost. God always does business with the individual. So this morning, I bring you an empty chair. This chair is a reserved chair. This chair is reserved for the woman, or the man, or the child that lives in a dark room. I think our churches have got things really backwards. We try to sell people on our programs and ministries. We try to sell people in our buildings and the things that we have going on. The only thing that we could possibly ever sell is the love of God. Amen? Amen? This chair is reserved for people in a dark room. Western Hills 
we need to be that church that's looking for this for women like this people like this teenagers like this men like this people that are just down to their last shot they deserve a place like Western Hills we have something to give that no one else can give and that's hope that's grace that's love this woman all she wanted to do is touch the hem of his garment all we have as a church is the love of Jesus I mean people can come to churches and they can find all kinds of different things I mean you can find a church right now that can entertain you more than we do you can find a church right now that's a lot smaller than you that can offer more intimate intimate settings than we do you can find a church that that that, that has a has a nicer auditorium but I'm telling you every church has the one thing that this world needs and that is God's love and this church has to be a light in this community. The darker the room, the greater the need for light. We have a reserved chair. Uh, most of y'all don't, don't really know who I am or, or what I've done. I thought this would, might be appropriate to kind of open the door a little bit. I consider this my first sermon here. The last two Sundays were a little different. I want you to know that this chair is for me. I have sat in this chair. My story is very simple. I grew up at West Nashville Heights with my mama and my two older sisters. Uh, my daddy didn't go to church. It was just me and my mama, and sometimes my sisters off and on. Uh, we would walk to church. My mom never drove. Uh, she never had a driver's license. Um, so every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night, we walked to church, whether it was raining, snowing, cold, or hot. And there were sometimes, there were, uh, there were people at, at West Nashville Heights that would pull over at, on Charlotte Pike, usually right there by the McPherson's, uh, uh, McPherson's auto place where they sold cars and they would pick us up and take us to church. And uh, that, was, that was my family. We were very poor. Uh, my folks made about $8,000 a year. Uh, my dad didn't have a job. He got out of the Korean War and uh, was a little messed up. Uh, he tried to work. But the paranoia of schizophrenia was just too much for him. And uh, he wasn't the dad that he, that he should have been. My mom did the very best to try to keep things together. And, uh, and it was hard. It was difficult. And I, like a lot of teenagers in West Nashville, struggled. I dealt with things when I was nine years old. I had, uh, I mean, I had my first, first shot of alcohol in my backyard when I was 11. I smoked my first, first joint. It's what I grew up in. It's who I was. By the time I got 15 or 16, going to Hillsborough High School, I was extremely messed up. I'd done a lot of things that I was not proud of. I got hooked on a lot of drugs and, and uh, different things. Barely graduated from high school. I think I was, man, I was like, I don't know, I think, I think uh, my graduating, I think I graduated 187 out of 300 people. So I didn't have the best academic pedigree. Got out of high school. All I simply wanted to do was just get a job and try to survive. I started dating this, this woman by the name of Susie Biggs. Susie was completely opposite of me. Uh, she was a Bellevue girl. I was a West Nashville boy. Uh, she was a goody two-shoes. She was a choir girl at Lipscomb. Uh, 
And I was not, uh, college was not in my picture. It was not in my future. It was not on my timeline. My timeline was to very simply get out and find a good 40-hour blue-collar job. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely no, I tell my kids that yes all the time. You don't have to go to college to be successful. You can get out of high school and you can be a successful person by working with your hands. You can work hard. That's what I was going to do. God had different plans. Um, he just had different plans for me. I honestly thought that I would never in a million years ever go to college. I took the ACT and made a 17 on it. I mean, I just, <clears throat> there was nothing out there for me. I was poor, <clears throat> and I was white trash. And God changed things. And Susie and I got married in June of 1995. The youth minister at James Avenue Church of Christ. And then my life fell apart. For about a year, um, I had, I had went through all of the savings that Susie had saved up with her own, uh, with her own job. She was a teacher at, at East Middle School down on Gallatin Road, and she had saved up money. She'd worked hard and saved money. And I had gotten a hold of the money, and I'd gotten hooked back on my addictions. And my addictions multiplied. If you're an, a, an addictive person, you will find very quickly that one thing usually doesn't do it for you. You can bounce to multiple things. You can get hooked on something and you have to go to the next thing and then the next thing. And the levels and, the, and, and just keeps getting higher and deeper and bigger. And that was me for about a year. I went through several thousand dollars of our money. I went through, uh, uh, I went through money at our church at James Avenue. They were supporting me to go to college. They were paying every single penny for me to go to Lipscomb University. That small church called James Avenue with 80 people were paying for me to go to college. And I took that money because of sin and blew it. I dropped out of Lipscomb. I created my own grade sheets. Presented it to the elders so they could keep giving me the money. I lived in a very dark room. And this happened for about a year. I did everything I could to cover up all my mistakes and all my footsteps and all the pain and the wrecks, the wreckage. I mean... You could look back and you could just see just a, just a wreckage, just a, just a train wreck. The whole time during this, this spot, I was still the minister at James Avenue. I was still married. And it, my life was just a mess. I didn't finally. Susie, along with her family, Scott and Woody and Carlisa and her mom, uh, it was finally over for me. It was done. The elders at my church found out. And my life had collapsed. It was in October of 1996 that I was told by the elders at James Avenue that I needed to step away. It's in October of 96 that Susie pretty much gave me an ultimatum. Either get your life straightened up or we're done. We're finished. And I left. I went to a rehab place for six months up in Kentucky. And 
and it was very difficult on me. It was, uh, it was extremely hard on Susie. It was embarrassing. It was shameful. I was on the prayer list of several churches. I was on the prayer list here at Western Hills. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but there were elders here. I don't know who they were at that time. But in the mid-90s, in 96, there was a group of men that prayed for me in that room over there. Don't, I don't even know if any of you were here in that eldership. But you prayed for my name. And you may not even know me, but you prayed for me. Six months after October of 96, I was able to come home. And life slowly started getting put back together. But it was extremely slow. Susie, by the grace of God, uh, just reached down deep, deep into her soul and gut and forgave me. Same thing with her family. They forgave me. My church, James Avenue, eventually gave me another shot. Never discredit the power of the church. Amen? If that small church at James Avenue had not given me a second chance, I might have never been standing here today. Lipscomb took me back, uh, even though they knew that I had lied and deceived even though they knew my situation. Remember, there was this professor there named Dr. Matheny called me in, and he and I talked a long time. Um, and so, so here I am. Very much like this woman in Mark chapter 5. I mean, her room was dark. There was no one else. Nothing else that could have saved her. She had been bleeding for 12 years. No man, no cure, no doctor, no amount of money could save her except for Jesus. And you have me. No college, no church. No wife, no mother-in-law, no one could save me except Jesus. I stand here today as a very blessed man. Some people might say a lucky man, I don't know. All I know is I'm just being very honest with y'all. This is who I am. This is who you have. There are a lot of weaknesses that, that we all have. I have many weaknesses of my own. What I do know is that I am extremely thankful that God pulled me out of the depths of sin and that he reserved a chair for me in a church. Now, as your preacher here, I'll just tell you, to me it does not matter who walks through those glass doors. It could be the mayor, or it could be a homeless man. Both of those people, in my eyes, are very welcomed here. 
does not matter if that person walks in the door and he or she is struggling with a deep, dark sin. As a church, we must. We are commanded to wrap our arms around that person and say, we love you. You can make it. God's good. He's big. Let's do something. Let's help change your life. That is the church that I want to be at. I hope and pray that Western Hills is that place. I hope that that this group that goes to Honduras, as they go to Honduras and they change lives, I hope that that not only can they change lives there, but I hope that if they were able to somehow bring back people from Honduras, that we would welcome those children in here. We would welcome those men and women in here. I would hope that we wouldn't have to be able to go to a mission field and, 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 and try to change lives and help them out and say, hey, it was great knowing you. You stay over there. Now we're going to go over to our building. I hope that we're a church that, that, that has the mindset we can go to a mission field and we can bring them right back to this building. Amen? Amen. I, this is the chair that I won't field. It's reserved. It is reserved for sinners. It's reserved for people in dark rooms. It's reserved for people who do not have their lives together. It's reserved for people who's, uh, who, 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 who are, don't have a shot in the world. And I don't say this arrogantly or pridefully, but just because your life is messed up and you've had the deck stacked against you doesn't mean that you can't be somebody one day. I'm a 40-year-old man, and I believe that God has worked a miracle in my life. I should not be standing here. If it wasn't for God and my family, I could have very easily and simply been some drunk in a ditch getting water from a youth group on a Saturday afternoon. That could have been me. But I stand in a a very nice building with good people. And I would bet... there are other people in this room that have dark rooms. I would think there are other people that have rooms that have been very dark. I bet you've got your own story, your own situation. This seat is for you. It's a church The answer to the world's problems today is God. So if you're sitting here today, and for me the invitation is very real. If you're sitting here today and you're broken, you're lost, you are carrying around baggage and weight and burdens that are just bringing you down to the ground, as a church we want to pray with you. Or maybe you're sitting there and you don't know who Jesus is, but you know that your life is completely out of control. This woman reached down and wanted to touch the hem of his garment, and she was healed completely, instantly, and 100%, and it was over. We want you to do something about that. The interesting thing about this story, at the very end, you'll notice that Jesus calls this woman daughter. Now, maybe in 12 years... Jesus was the only person that had called her daughter. For 12 years, finally one person reached down and loved her. This morning, we love you for all your flaws, for all your weaknesses. If you're in a dark room, and you need some light, it's up here. Please come as we stand and sing.